Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, uh, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to the hot topic of the Heidelberg Laureate Forum. My name is Martin Enserink. I'm a science journalist. Uh, I'm the international news editor at Science Magazine, a global research journal. And uh, I specialize in infectious diseases and global health. And I'm based in Amsterdam, which is about a five-hour train ride from Heidelberg. Um, the topic of today's session really is hot, because we're going to talk about uh, epidemic modeling. And uh, I think uh, it's fair to say that there's never been a time when modeling has been uh, so much uh, in the media and in discussion. Um, and models are hugely important during the COVID pandemic. Entire societies have been shut down uh, because of the forecasts from modelers. Uh, Models predicted surging cases, overburdened hospitals, and governments had to act on those. Uh, but models can be hard to understand for, for, for the public. And often uh, the, 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 the results from the models, the outcomes, the predictions have, been, have differed, and sometimes they've been spectacularly wrong. It's sometimes a bit of a black box, if you're not, not a mathematician, how these models work. Um, and when I wrote a story about uh, COVID-19 last year for science and about modeling, I came across what is apparently an old saying, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. So why are they, they, why are they sometimes wrong? And um, how can they be, be improved? And how do modelers talk to the public and to the decision makers about the uncertainty in their models? And what do the people who use the models, um, what do they think? Are, the, are models useful? How can they be improved? So those are the issues we're going to discuss today. And we have four uh, great speakers lined up for you, uh, two of whom are here, here in Heidelberg. The other two will be joined, um, will, will join online. And I'll introduce them one by one. Um, they will each speak for about 10 to 12 minutes. I've ask them to keep it short so that we have time for a discussion at the end. So please uh, send us your questions through the conference system, and I hope you enjoy their, their presentations. Our first speaker is uh, joining us from London, and his name is Sebastian Funk. Uh, he is a professor of infectious disease dynamics at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Uh, he's also a Wellcome Trust senior research fellow. And uh, Sebastian is one of those people who builds models. He has uh, worked with many organizations, including the World Health Organization, the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, Public Health England, and he also leads the EPI Forecast Group. Uh, and that's a group of scientists that produce real-time modeling of diseases uh, in collaboration with public health decision makers. Um, Sebastian, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you for having me. Um, so, uh, can you see my slides? Do I need to do anything to get these slides? Here they are. Okay. What I will try to give you in the next 10 minutes is a um, subjective overview of what, to me, modeling is what it's useful for and what its limitations are. And I will argue that it's largely a tool for structured thinking through knowns, unknowns, and the consequences of assumptions that one makes. Um, now, an another way of, of putting this is um, that models are a tool to combine data on what we know, uh, so what we know with theory, so what we think, to learn about what we don't know. And um, the kind of questions that we often get asked during infectious disease outbreaks are, how transmissible is this? How severe is it? So those were the kind of questions that were particularly important early on in the um, COVID-19 pandemic. And, uh, but also things like, what, which ones are the populations at risk? Where is it gonna go next? And all these kind of questions are ideally answered with data. And models really are an excuse that you can use when you don't, when there's things that you don't have data on. And so uh, you do that by using the, the bits of data that you have and combine them with things that you think are correct and you get outcomes and they are the things uh, that you want to learn. Now, as an example, I mean, one, one uh, in biology is germ theory. So we know that uh, infectious 
infections spread via pathogens and direct contact. And so if we illustrate this, so if you have a population and someone is infected, um, starts infecting others, and they infect others and so on and so forth. And this is where you get the um, now famous exponential behavior of uh, epidemics and outbreaks that we've seen so many times with uh, COVID-19, for example, as well as other diseases before. The other thing that we know is that people recover from disease. So they become, so it's here colored in blue. Uh, so um, in some way, um, in, in most people, the, the, there's a successful immune reaction to an infection. And uh, once that has happened, there's some level of immunity, some memory, and that person, at least initially, no, can no longer be infected. And um, we, I'm just trying to get to the next slide, which is not happening. Uh, we're just trying to, just going to relearn this. Okay, here we go. Yeah, sorry, one back. Uh, and this is encoded in the now uh, relatively famous SIR model. So it's it's simply putting these relatively simple relationships and and kind of insights, or you could arguably call it theory together um, in something that you can then do calculations on, that you can simulate in a computer, and you can draw conclusions from. And uh, one, one of the, the, just to give you an example of this kind of approach, a question early on in the COVID-19 pandemic was um, how transmissible this is. And this was before it even started, we started working on this before it became widespread around the world when it was largely uh, confined to China and a few cases that have been found in passenger flights. And so then with that, the question was, how can we use what we know? So having seen, having those case series, relatively noisy case series from different places, how we can put these together to learn something about how transmissible it is and particularly to find out um, what its reproduction number was. So this, the um, again, something that has become a fairly well-known concept now, the number of cases uh, secondary cases or the number of follow-on cases that someone who becomes infected generates. So we put together a model that was fairly similar to this SIR model that I just showed with a bit more detail. You can see that on the left there, um, where we uh, included the population of Wuhan, where the original outbreak was reported from in China, as well as the cases in international travelers. And you can see that on the right, that the, the black dots there were the data points. And we had this model. We fitted this model to the data. So this is the line you can see through there. And by combining these international and uh, nationally reported cases, we could get some picture of what the reproduction number was at the time. Uh, that is how infectious that was. And that gave us some indication of what the risk was. And it became very clear that there was a, a, a genuine risk of uh, seeing sustained spread elsewhere um, once the infection was introduced. And I'm just going to, next slide, yeah. Okay, another key unknown and one that we are asked about particularly often by policymakers is the future. And Martin already mentioned forecasts and I'm glad you mentioned forecasts because there's, there are many different ways in which models can describe the, for, uh, the future. One is forecasts. So by looking at the past trajectory of cases and having a model that is fitted to that, one can simulate that model forward, make a forecast. And so again, this is kind of idea that we have a theory. So we have some, we know something about spread. We put this together. We've seen things so far. So in principle, if that theory is correct, we should be able to run that forward and predict the future. In practice, this isn't so easy. And here, um, for example, this is a project we run. It's a so-called forecast hub, European forecast hub, where we collate forecasts from uh, many, many, over 20 modeling teams from across Europe that all submit week, on a weekly basis the latest predictions for what the number of cases will look like across Europe. And I give you here an example from Germany, given that this is, uh, an event is hosted in Germany. And so you see these green lines, which is the prediction, and the black lines is the data. And the, the green lines come out of the data. And in a perfect world, if these predictions are always correct, they would align with the data. And what you can see instead is that quite often they go quite a long way away from the data, and uh, they are also attached with quite a lot of uncertainty, which is shown here as the green bars. And the reason for this is that there are many things that are happening in an epidemic that are really difficult to predict, that we don't have good theory for, and that are difficult to encode in a model, such as changes in behavior um, due to uh, spread, or uh, but also changes in policy. So. Kind of in order to make a good prediction, a good forecast of COVID-19, you have to predict politicians' behavior as well as individual behavior. 
and we generally don't include that in the model and really we don't know either how we would do that in, in the best way. So it's hard to make forecasts, at least in the long term. It's easier in the short term, one or two weeks, um, but it's hard to do in the long term. But what you can do is you can still make statements about the future, but you can make statements about the future that are conditioned on a specific assumption that you make. And this is one example that was made by the um, uh, Commission of Modelers. So in the UK, there is a body of modelers called SPIM or SPIMO that uh, on a weekly basis provides evidence to politicians and policymakers that then uh, politicians use or base their decisions on. And this was one from the end of October where there was a projection. You see there's something that says projection on the current trend. And by projection, we mean a forecast or a, a, um, a, a, a simulation, a prediction about the future under the specific assumption that nothing is to change. So we, we take out all this, what I just said about individuals changing behavior and other things changing that are not encoded in the model. And we say, well, we can't really make a statement. We can't make a good forecast. But what we can tell you is that if things are as they stay as they are, then this is what we would see. And that's what you can see here as a red line. We call that a projection. And in that case, it became, or it was clear that at the trajectory at the time there, this is the, the dashed vertical line, within four to six week, weeks, we would reach um, hospital capacity within the UK. And that was one of the uh, of evidence that went into then a four week lockdown that started in um, early November. And in fact, the, um, sorry, just going to the next slide. Okay. There we are. The, the credibility of that statement was based on the preceding four to six weeks, where in all these cases, there wasn't much evidence that anything was changing. Uh, the, the, the dots were perfectly in line with the predictions made all this time before. And whilst we weren't sure that there wasn't going to be a change or a turnaround, there wasn't any particular reason to believe that cases and hospitalizations wouldn't continue as they were. And so this was, whilst not a prediction that we would stand up to and say, this is definitely going to happen, it was still a useful tool for policy in order to assess the relationship between the current level of admissions, the trajectory, and the relationship of both of these to the um, capacity in the health system. And then lastly, instead of just assuming that everything is going to be the same, something that you can do with, with models is you can make explicit assumptions. You can test ranges of assumptions. And so again, this is something from the, um, from the from SPIAM. And in this uh, case, uh, we looked at different scenarios or uh, particularly the um, it was research led by Matt Keeling and others. They looked at different scenarios of how fast the vaccine rollout was to continue. We didn't know and nobody knew at the time how fast the vaccine rollout could would continue. So it wasn't possible to make a prediction because that was an unknown and something that we didn't have any information on, but we could test or modelers could test different assumptions. And so lay out a range of scenarios neither of which was probably going to become reality because these weren't forecasts. These weren't, these weren't created with the idea that one of these would happen, um, but at least they could lay out kind of a range of possibilities that again, policymakers could use to make, base um, decisions on. And so to summarize, I hope I've made it clear that models are a tool. They're not a crystal ball. They can combine things that we know with assumptions and theory, it's important to know what the assumptions and the theory are that go into a model. If they are wrong, then the model will be wrong. But they allow us, they're, they're an excuse for data and they can replace data where we don't have data. It's really important to always be aware of the limitations and the assumptions that go into a model, but often or sometimes they're the only thing that we have available. The main purposes of this kind of real-time modeling and outbreaks is to understand what's going on, to get better situational awareness, but then also, as I've shown in the end, to explore plausible or possible scenarios. And it's important to bear in mind the distinction between forecasts and models can be used for forecasts, but they're usually not very good beyond a short time horizon versus projections versus scenarios. Thank you. Thank you very much for that nice talk, uh, Sebastian. I, I, I remember that paper well that you mentioned at the beginning about in the Lancet infectious disease that I remember being struck how you could use 
you know, some data from China and also from all these other cities where people with COVID had landed, and then to use that um, as a way to gauge uh, the reproductive number. I think uh, that's something that many people don't realize, that, that you can do that with modeling as well. It's not just about forecasts and projections. So I thought it was interesting. Um, we're going to our next speaker, uh, who's standing right next to me. It's uh, Shital Silal. Um, she is the director of the Modeling and Simulation Hub Africa, also called MASHA. She's also an associate professor in the Department of Statistical Sciences at the University of Cape Town. Um, Shital's models have helped governments in, in many lower and middle income countries make important decisions on, on diseases such as malaria, syphilis, and pertussis. Um, she's also a part of a modeling consortium that um, uh, advises the uh, South African government on COVID. And I'm, I'm very grateful that she's come all the way um, from Cape Town to Heidelberg for this uh, session. And uh, she and I had a beer last night on one of uh, the lovely squares here in town. And um, she tells, told me that, that outbreak modelers need, uh, need empathy. And I thought that's interesting because empathy is not usually the first thing you think about when, um, um, when you're talking about uh, mathematics. So uh, perhaps she will explain to you uh, what she means by that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And today, following my colleague's presentation on what the purpose of modeling is, I'd like to focus on the importance of taking into account context, diversity, and culture in our modeling. So when we are developing a disease transmission model, what are the primary steps? And we've listened to a little bit of this already, but to go through it briefly, we first need to review the existing knowledge base. We need to read up on global policy, understand the biology of the disease, the various treatment uh, options that are available. We then collect whatever data is available to us, and we then use this data to develop and build our mathematical models, choosing a methodology that is commensurate with the amount of data available to train our models. We then need to test our models to assess that they are in fact robust and doing what we believe they should be doing and sensible. And so we conduct sensitivity analyses, not just on the parameters, but also on the model structure itself. And we test out the assumptions that we're including in our models. And then we're in the position to run model scenarios, such as demonstrated by the previous speaker, these stochastic scenarios that allow us to, um, to come up with model findings with uncertainty ranges and confidence bands, and the last step is to communicate our model results and model findings to those who, have, who are requiring them. So taking into account the strengths, the limitations, the uncertainties, all the good, all the bad, and all the uglies to communicate in, a, in an honest manner. But when you take into account, or when you wish to take into account context, culture, and diversity, it requires you to do quite a bit more than your standard disease modeling that perhaps one learns in a degree or in a textbook. So what you have to do is to look at the population of interest. Perhaps you're focusing on a country. You need to read the local country policy documents. You need to read the monitoring and evaluation reports that tell you not just the policies that countries decided to implement or chose to implement, but also how well they implemented them into the past. You've got to take into account local epidemiology and particularly the health system characteristics, understanding how the population acts access the health system, and very importantly, understanding how data are collected and how representative the data are of the true underlying situation. So I'll give you a few examples from malaria. Um, in the many malaria models that I've built in LMIC, there have been a few characteristics that have always stood out for me in terms of being important to take local context, culture, and diversity into account. One is access to treatment. We start asking questions, who accesses treatment? How do they access treatment? Do the sick access treatment through the public health sector, through private care, through traditional medicine, or perhaps self-treatment, often by accessing drugs available on the counterfeit markets if you're not able to get them uh, yourselves through legitimate means? What about the um, questions around when people access care? Do you access care as soon as you fall sick? Or do you access care or present late to treatment? 
In particular, we focus on the barriers to access to treatment. So are there groups in the population who simply do not have access to the care that is perhaps even freely available to them? In malaria, one such group are our high-risk groups of migrant and mobile populations. It is often the case that migrant and mobile populations are afraid to access the health care system, often because they are in the country through illegitimate means or because they feel the, the, the service that is provided is not acceptable. So in some cases, it is through xenophobia or through extra judgment that people do not feel comfortable accessing the healthcare system. Now, we need to know all of this. You ask yourself, disease modeling is about maths. Why does this matter? It matters because it helps us understand better how effective these policies are, how effective those drugs are if they're able to actually get to the populations who need them. And we, it's able to help us understand who's missed. Likewise, in malaria, we have what we call uh, insecticide-treated nets. These nets help um, you sleep under them, and they prevent mosquito bites. So they help to prevent transmission in that way. And it is not enough that countries distribute millions of nets. It matters if they are used. In some communities, nets may be used um, as a, a source for, for fishing, as a fishing net, because it helps to bring money into the household. But in many, many high prevalence settings, these nets are simply not suitable to, to many of the population, or there's no appetite to really use them. So brand new nets are kept in the cupboard or given away or discarded. And so these nets are not achieving the maximum impact that they need. And there are many examples like this, social behavior, environmental considerations, and I could go on forever talking about each of them. But let's move on to a next topic. What do we do when there's no data available? Now, if we consider the health surveillance systems in many LMIC and many countries around the world, they are often weak. And this can be for historical reasons or even in more recent times due to limited budgets. You'd rather be spending the limited pot of money you have for health on buying drugs, on um, taking care of hospitals or, or, or um, making sure there's enough staff rather than getting a much better or establishing a much better data collection system. In other cases, surveillance systems or data simply doesn't exist. Using COVID-19 as an example, at the very start of the epidemic early last year, we had to make not just the short-term forecast that we could perhaps do comfortably using existing data, but we had to make long-term projections, six-month worth of projections at the very beginning when no data was available. So what did we do? We established expert panel groups. The one thing I hope that becomes across quite clearly during this presentation is that mathematical modeling is not the domain of just mathematics or just computer science. It is multidisciplinary by definition. So when we establish these expert panel groups, they comprise of doctors, of epidemiologists, biologists, virologists, those working in the public health system, economists, those in government, all coming together to bring to take international data and bring some context to the situation in which you are modeling. And that is where this question of empathy uh, comes in, because you need to be able to empathize with the population who is being served ultimately by these models. We may develop models for government, but government is using these models to develop policy to help people on the ground. And they are the ultimate end user, and that is exactly where empathy is uh, required. So these expert panels, what they do is they help to contextualize information. One quick example that I could cite is when it came to critical care and understanding in my country, South Africa, the likelihood of people accessing critical care and how long they might spend in a critical care bed. We could not just take the um, parameter values or these estimates from European countries because in South Africa, they are far more strict criteria to enter hospital in the first place and then to remain in the ICU. And so this is exactly where the expert panel helps to bring everything together in order to take this international information and make it relevant for the population you're trying to serve. And lastly, all of this at the end of the day only really matters if we can communicate our model findings in a clear way. So what we have found is that if we, as scientists, convey our model findings objectively and honestly and with humility, 
and therefore citing it, what the models can do, their strengths, citing the limitations as well as all the very vast uncertainty in developing these models, then we are able to establish a good relationship with the stakeholders who are in charge of making decisions. And we've also found that using appropriate tools help to bring these lots of equations and numbers in a meaningful way to to, to, for the stakeholders to understand. So, for example, using interactive dashboards, maps, clear plots, um, talking with non-technical phrases, as well as developing focused output to each stakeholder group that you are serving, we have found these all to be useful measures in better communicating our model findings. And so in conclusion, what I'd like to leave you with is that I have found in my experience that among all the models that I've developed across a variety of diseases and for many countries around the world, the models that have been the most useful are those that have paid the due respect and attention to the local context of the population in which they serve. Thank you. Thank you, Shital. That was really interesting. I I guess you really made clear why you need empathy and also why modeling is not something that you do just behind your desk. You really need uh, a lot of information on the ground, which in many countries is very hard to get by. Right? So, so you also need really good relationships with the people that can provide you those Absolutely. data. Right, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we go to our third speaker, um, Julia Fitzner. Uh, you've now heard from two modelers. Uh, we're now going to the other side, if you will, to people who, uh, who use models, uh, uh, the client, as, um, as Sheetal called them, or maybe the, 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 the consumer, however you want to call it. Julia is not a modeler, uh, but um, she works at the World Health Organization uh, headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland, where she's the team lead for data and analysis in the Global Influenza Program. Welcome, Julia. Julia has been involved in the response to many outbreaks and epidemics around the world uh, at WHO, including yellow fever, SARS, uh, the influenza pandemic of 2009, and currently, of course, uh, the coronavirus pandemic. Welcome, Julia, again, and um, the floor is yours. Well, thanks a lot for this nice introduction and welcome. And, and I'm very happy that I am actually talking right after Sheetal, who is bringing a lot of this kind of contextual thing to it. I will focus a little bit more on actually the data that is used then for the uh, with the models and then how we actually use them and, and what we need to do and maybe also on where we go sort of with the next steps on, on what we need to understand and on, on going further with all these kind of data and models that are already um, uh, available around the world. So. Just, um, and this is a little bit going back to the basics again as well. Um, what are we asking at the beginning and, and, and during any uh, pandemic? And it's really sort of, do we know how transmissible the disease is or stays? I mean, now with the new variants coming up, we are still asking also, how do they, those kind of transmissibility, how does the transmissibility of the disease change? How severe is the disease or the part of the disease and who's most affected? So who is the ones that we need to care most about and protect? But also what is the impact on our health system um, and on society? And finally, and this is sort of also these kind of scenario modelings, what, how do the interventions that we plan or have at hand change this natural progression? of the disease. Let me see if this works. Next slide, please, it doesn't. So going back now to what we have sort of currently at the global level, we have a lot of data and we are collecting a lot of data. So we have the data of the current COVID pandemic at the global level. We know we have reported of now nearly 230 million cases and nearly 5 million deaths. And, and we have them sort of by the region, by the country. We also sort of have the cases and the deaths by age group. So we can see trajectories and these data are important then to sort of make other, uh, to make models and, and see further projections. We also have, next slide please, like the vaccine coverage. So we do know 
where people have been vaccinated. We see here the big uh, hole in the African continent of, of being vaccinated and compared to other countries. Next slide, please. We also have data, and this is actually done then now, the collection of data from people around the world that actually give this voluntarily to us. So it's, it's individuals in the countries who, who um, give us information on what public health measures are used, and then we calculate an index out of it. So we can see the, the over time, this is sort of from, from last week, but we can see over time how public health me measures have been used. And this was as uh, Sebastian was saying this, these things are important if we want to then judge and look at the data and the models that we see and that were used. We also have, and this is now just a snapshot of the GSA um, um, data, which is the data on the actual virus gen genomics. So here you see sort of the, the, um, the snapshot from three days ago. So we have more than 3 million genomes of viruses that have been analyzed in detail. And we can then make these kind of differences. We see these, you, have, you now, most people know now about these things. This is very new as well. People know and talk about alpha, beta, gamma and delta variant. And, and you see where they come from. And we have a lot of detailed information on, on these deep genomics as well, which again is important to consider when making models. Next slide. We also, I mean, while we have heard that we have the data on the cases, the case reporting, and this was also stressed by, by Shital, it doesn't mean that we actually have all these, that, that the cases that are reported is referring to the right number of cases. So we also have um, a looking on what is actually the serology of who has had either vaccinated now or uh, has the disease in the different had had the disease in the different countries, and so we summar we have here the different studies that have looked into what is the serology of COVID in the different countries, and then and again this is important to understand the trajectory that is then done with the different models. Next slide. And so this was just a snapshot of the different data to be used. And, and when then we use these, we do use models with these different data, we apply the different algorithms. And as Sebastian was saying, we then sort of look to fill gaps um, of the different data. Because the data that we have, though, is not the same wherever we get it from. So we have the really lack of completeness. We also have lack of timeliness and of quality, which again, modern algorithms and sort of models or artificial, artificial intelligence can help to, to really close those gaps, but they need to be considered and thought carefully through. And then we get these different results from the different modelers and they are very different, or they have a very wide variety of, of results, which is then really difficult to grasp from, from the people that Technical problem. It looks like we have a technical problem. We seem to have lost uh, Julia. I, I hope that can be restored. Um, right. Um, she was in the middle of an interesting talk, but we've lost her. Uh, I, I'm, I'm looking at the pe technical people. I hope we can get her back. Um, or should we move on to the next talk for now? Or, um, yeah. I think we're going to the next talk. Yeah, and hopefully uh, Julia can finish her talk uh, after that. All right, um, that's going to happen at hybrid meetings. It's a technical challenge, um, but uh, we're, so we're continuing. Our last speaker today, oh, oh Julia's back, okay. 
I don't we know lost where you I momentarily. Lost. Uh, please, please finish your talk, Julia. <laughs> okay. So next slide. So there is there is a lot on comparing, and and um, Sheetal as well as Sebastian have been saying there are in these groups of experts that actually look into the different models, and this is a very very important thing so that the models that different experts can have a look into the different models and can help each other. So these are the experts. Oops, I think we lost her again. Um, I think we lost her again. Um, I, yes, we may have to go to our next speaker, right? Okay. Sorry about that. Um, our next speaker is Amris Baiju, who has now also joined me here on the stage. Um, Amris is also not a modeler, but uh, he is a field epidemiologist and microbiologist. He has worked uh, in many uh, humanitarian crises around the world, places like refugee camps, war zones, I believe. Um, and um, he recently took a new job with uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, also known as Doctors Without Borders. He is director of their uh, Luxor Operational Research Unit, which is based in Luxembourg. Um, Amrish is from the Netherlands, just like me, and I've seen him on television a lot the last 18 months uh, in all kinds of talk shows where he is often very, very critical of the, the Dutch coronavirus approach. Uh, I found that really interesting. Uh, he's also been crit critical sometimes of epidemic, epidemic models and the way they are used. So I'm curious what Amrish has to say today. Hello, everybody. So uh, thanks for having me here. And indeed, I'm trying to play a little bit of the devil's advocate, not to say that something is good or that it's bad, but to kind of better know and yeah, get to know each other's worlds. Uh, on one side, the academic world, and on one side, the world that we, uh, with Doctors Without Borders, work in, which is often um, the emergencies that are most difficult, where data is never readily available, where surveillance systems are lacking. Um, maybe just a little bit of a, a background. Um, our line of work, medical aid, where it's needed most, we do it independent, neutral, and impartial. Um, we work in over 70 countries. I don't want one too fast. 70 countries, uh, and we have over 65,000 staff members, um, and we do our work as close to the ground as possible by running health facilities, by running medical facilities, which gives us also a unique eye into many humanitarian emergencies where not many actors actually work. These are some of the subjects that we work in. Right, so it's everything related to infectious disease, but not limited to infectious disease, non-communicable disease, um, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, in communities like refugee populations that have lack to access to healthcare, um, big diseases uh, that have been there since the start of humanity, like malaria, that are very dependent for their control on national budgets. Uh, and that also reignite, uh, well, this COVID crisis reignited and, and, and put us back in much of the progress that has been gained of many years. So we're not just looking at COVID-19. Let me just kind of zoom in in you know, the outbreaks, humanitarian health emergencies. Increasingly, we are becoming aware that we are codependent on each other, um, that we need our best in terms of work, our brightest, to work together. Um, and I was surprised during the pandemic, I had hoped we would have done a little bit of a better job, uh, both in the countries that we come from, as well as a global village, to say so. This is an image that maybe many of you are now familiar with. It's a classic epidemiological curve, right? Um, Typically, you have a patient zero, and then at one point when you have enough patients in a hospital and there's an alert, um, we start interventions. And that is hopefully something that comes onto the screen now. And then your intervention begins. And if you do your job in the right way, um, you will come to areas like capacity building, lessons learned, policy formation, academic research. At least that's a classical dogma. In reality, we're constantly learning, we're constantly adapting, we're constantly improving. There's also an added complexity of dimension that was added, right? So more data sources are available. Not in the least because we have more advanced diagnostics here and there available, 
unfortunately not in many of our settings. Um, and a couple of years ago, we wrote a paper on that, uh, which talks really about um, yeah, data science in outbreaks. How can we improve that and how can we work better together? So we also use a lot of open data sources, right? To get data on, uh, well, from maps, GIS types of data, and we have many more possibilities when it comes to analysis. Um, we also have more advanced clinical data, mostly here in the West, not so much in the areas that we work on. So if you look at what is really interesting for us, much of it is actually summed down to what we call basic descriptive epidemiology. It is not rocket science, but it's incredibly pivotal to the work that we do. All the other types of discussions related to mathematical modeling, unfortunately for us, are not directly relevant, but we need to keep in constant dialogue to see how we can improve workflows and how we can make the data that we have more useful so we get better output from the academic world as well. Let me walk you through an example. For example, um, when this crisis started, of course, like the first question was, how hard is it going to hit uh, refugee camps? And one of the biggest refugee camps uh, that we know is the, the refugee camp in Cox's Bazaar um, that started during the, the outlooks of Rohingya refugees for, from uh, Myanmar back in 2017. And the headlines hit it uh, in that modeling study that, you know, that the impact was going to be really bad. Um, and we kind of knew that because basically none of the basic measures that we have become so accustomed to are applicable or are implementable in many of these um, refugee camps. So March 8th, first case in Bangladesh where the camp is located. Um, the preprint of this paper was published on the 26th uh, of March. Um, and we wanted to know, of course, what the potential impact was going to be, how much did we need to scale up. The study was published in, in one of the more prestigious medical journals um, in, in June 16th. But there were two kind of highlights that I want to highlight here. One is that if you look at the main findings, uh, one of the main findings was that, yeah, it might have been bad and the refugee camps didn't have structures to support um, if things would go wrong. Um, and we need to come up with novel approaches. None of this was actually new to us or actually contributed anything to the work we were doing. On top of that, and it's not a criticism to any individuals, zero authors on this paper were actually from the country itself. Let's stand, were actively working in that specific emergency. So there was a lot of contextual information missing. Another example, cholera is a disease that we are very familiar with. It's, it's, a, it's a disease that is spread through, through water, um, and we know that it can be endemic, for example, during periods of floods. And one of these articles that we came across, for example, cholera outbreaks can be predicted using climate data and AI. And I just highlighted uh, one of the, the main findings of the need is that human factors are important for cholera incidents, such as access to water resources. Again, nothing new to us, doesn't really help us in our operational work. Why? We will never be able to pinpoint when exactly a cholera outbreak is gonna happen because we never have that type of surveillance capacity. And even with novel tools, if we could pinpoint it, we often can't reach those areas or don't have the means to kind of work in these type of areas. So I guess the key question is, what does it add and how does it help us? So we deliver data, right, in, in a theoretical exercise. And for us, magic happens when we give it to mathematical modelers and people that are way smarter than we are. And then ideally, what we hope is to get out this Eureka solution. And then if you look at reality, um, the data we deliver, not high quality. And what you get out, yeah, unfortunately, also not high quality. And I specifically use these two emoticons that everybody knows nowadays because it's, it's a famous saying in applied epidemiology, uh, shit in, shit out. Too often I feel that the link with public health professionals that are working on the ground is lacking. And, you know, that makes it mathematical modeling sometimes a little bit of a classic academic driven study or a limited study of which operational utility remains to be questioned for us working in difficult contexts. There's limited awareness of the operational context. And on our side, there is limited awareness of the academic support mechanisms, which are often so complex and fast moving that we don't even see what the proper picture is. And an Ebola funeral, um, for example, where infection prevention measures are not properly 
used can completely change the course of an Ebola outbreak. Um, often we're not consulted on parameter estimations and the parameters are kind of like the, the known unknowns that you want to feed into your model. Um, but also we deal with different incentive models. My work is to deliver med the best medical care possible to populations in need. And yes, that sometimes does conflict with the academic model of publishing. But it's important. The global trends in humanitarian response look grim. Uh, we see more fragile contacts, more people being displaced by conflicts, uh, not in the least to amplify it all due to the COVID-19 crisis and climate change. The duration of our responses is on average longer and much more complex as we've all experienced during this pandemic. And financial support is not growing accordingly. So our capacity to respond to emergencies is drastically and radically tested. And then there's a few elements on the complexity of the data that we deliver. Much of the data we still collect is by necessity sometimes collected on paper. Um, so 90% of our time in the field settings, we're busy with merging different types of data sets, getting data from an, a very badly maintained Excel file and, and merge it all together. Data cleaning, recleaning, problem solving, you know, getting clearance to actually share data, which is a really important subject. Uh, and we have narrow time frames for analysis, right? Because the time pressure is immense during these health emergencies. So the question is, how much time do we actually have for actual work? And that fueled the, you know, the, the, the kind of need for us to focus on the development of tools. And if you look at the cycle from data to action, um, for us, there's a few elements that are very important. Data cleaning, having graphics and data visualizations that are insightful, good descriptive tool and consistent reporting because we need to report on a daily basis and we want to do it consistent so that decision makers can take the best informed decisions possible. What do we need for that? Well, a lot of our work lies in good descriptive epidemiology. A lot is inherent in the ways that we collect data um, and it, you know, surveillance capacity is always a limited aspect in our working area. Um, Having good tools that help us, as I said, with you know, the things like around data cleaning, visualization, parameter estimations, predictions, but especially consistent reporting. So the, but actually the role of advanced analytics in a humanitarian sphere of field epidemiology has been limited so far. So why is it relevant? I'm just going to speed to this slide. It will generate more time to actually work on our real job, which is actually solving an emergency. It helps us identify the right bottlenecks, treating patients better. We'll make data more comparable around time and across different places. And that by itself, of course, fortifies the way we can actually do science and improve practices. But it also helps us communicating with stakeholders, um, increase awareness of what actually is happening, interact with affected communities, and a very important point, and advocate based on solid evidence. There's two examples of you know, the improvement of tools that I kind of want to highlight to you and that you can go and have a look at. The r for epis project, which was a collaboration between um, many, uh, let's say, more theoretical epidemiologists, people that have a lot of experience with R, uh, and many of the field epidemiologists that do the day-to-day -day work, um, and that these are er specific areas where we need help, for example, to make these so-called situational reports, uh, where we have ready-made R scripts, you just put your data in, it's automatically cleaned, inconsistencies are removed, and you get a nice Word document with tables that you can edit, uh, basically visualizations that you can partially edit or export in Excel depending on whatever you're using. And yes, Excel is still the most used tool. Keep that in mind. Another resource developed by good friends of mine was the Epidemiologist R Handbook because what we need is materials to train, materials to build capacity. And that's often neglected, right? And, and for me, this has always been a really important subject because this is for me pivotal, building capacity in countries, building capacity on site and actually making countries less dependent on the need from academic institutes in our parts of the world. And as you can see, this was a project that was actually instigated and supported by, and I say that explicitly because you see the organizations here, but these were actually individuals within the organizations that shared a mindset and actually wanted to do this in their free time. Yes, in their free time. And they, used to, they made this huge resource. Why? Because not many people are interested in funding these types of really important pieces of work. And just to show you on how popular it is, the website since its launch in May 2021 has been visited 
250,000 times by 80,000 unique visitors in over 203 countries, over 600 users per day, and one in four users have returned and still are using this as a resource. Okay, just to conclude, um, for a new generation of scientists as well, I, I wanted to kind of discuss one thing. Um, it always starts with a useful question. Are you fishing in a data set or do you have really questions that you want to answer? Do you know where your data is coming from? Simple things like time, place, person, key epidemiological questions are really important to us. Also know what the limitations of your data are. What are the assumptions you'll have to make and how solid will these assumptions be? Um, know your audience. Um, and know how they read figures. You know, what is their understanding of statistics? How often we had to explain things like exponential growth during these crises to even fellow scientists or medical professionals, for example. Put your limitations always on top of your document. Um, is your output actionable? This requires from start to finish interactions with public health professionals. Talk with each other. Have you involved local actors from start to finish? Really important subject as often forgotten in, within academic institutes. Do you pay attention to global goods? And what I mean is, are you contributing to national capacity on site? And one of the things that is really important, and we always forget, we talk about the technicalities, but one of the things we neglect is to talk about new ways, standards and methods to actually collaborate with each other. Because, as I said, we do need each other. So, just to kind of end on a quote from Carl Sagan, and, and it comes from the pale blue dot, and if you haven't seen it, do look at it. In our obscurity and all this fastness, there's no hint that help will come from elsewhere to save us from ourselves. I think it by itself underlines the necessity for better interdisciplinary collaboration, but also honest collaborations. Thank you. Thank you, Amrish, for that uh, very helpful perspective from the humanitarian world. Um, I, I guess you made the point that sometimes modeling really is a distraction, although I, I assume for modelers it must be odd to see their, uh, their work represented by the poop emoji in your, uh, in, in, in your presentation. Um, I want to ask them uh, in the discussion uh, after this uh, how they feel about that. Um, but first, um, uh, Julia is back and um, I'd, I'd like to uh, invite her to finish her talk before we move on to the discussion. Julia? Yeah, thanks a lot. So actually, I, I think uh, Amrish was saying quite a lot of the things that I was going to uh, put forward as well. So I mean, there is a lot of there is actually a lot of data, but um, and, and there is a lot of different models. Uh, and but we often have not the local knowledge uh, or it's not taken into account and the context of the data is not used. The data is collected and and good analysis is done, but that analysis is actually not shared because, especially in, in low, low and middle income countries, because it, they just don't have the time to also publish it and, and share it. Other aspects that might influence the dynamic of the progression is, is not taken into account. And the result of models are sometimes contradicting and not so transparent. Um, and um, as the others, I think it's really the, the the open discussion among the different experts and especially multidisciplinary experts is really, really needed um, so that um, and it is not currently happening enough. And um, the last slide the, uh, that would come now is, is sort of the idea that we are starting to sort of think a little bit more out of the box uh, with opening of this pandemic an epidemic intelligence hub. Next slide, please, if you still have that. Um, where where we try to where we hope that we can bridge maybe some of those things. And I think it's 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 really the the sort of plea for also all the new scientists to sort of help us really get these things um, a little bit better. Uh, move a lot of the good things that are already there. And it's uh, it, it's also then trying to get the data better because a lot of the data could be better used if we don't do it anymore with with the classical surveillance collection but actually use federated uh, um, data access and and get it more semantically linked so that we can use more of the context and that we show then this kind of data more in real time that we do have more collaborative exploration of the data and um, and have more actionable real-time insight of these and then hopefully also we can move towards better decision locally and globally so that um that the different people can see the the um results of of these analysis and and it's it was 
nicely said also from Shital, we need to show the results. And, and all this only works if we do it collaboratively and if we do it learning together. Thanks a lot. And thanks for, and sorry for the technical problems. Over. All right. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, I think thanks to all the presenters for their talks. Uh, I, I think some common themes are emerging, although there's also some differences. Um, but, but clearly, uh, you all think that um, the models very much depend on the context. You need to have good local information. You have to need you need good data to come in for good models to come out. Um, there needs to be more uh, more collaboration. Uh, I think uh, that's a common theme um, in in gathering the data and building the models. And the communication is very important. How do you share the outcomes of the models with the people that the clients that need them and uh, and with the public? Um, and one thing I heard is the models need to be more useful sometimes. Um, but I kind of want to start with the, uh, the, 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 the poop emoji that uh, Amrish uh, shared. Because I think we all have seen in the past uh, year and a half that sometimes, sometimes the models are wrong, even when the even in countries that do have good data. I mean, um, Sebastian, maybe I can start with you. Um, in, in the United Kingdom, for instance, some models predicted uh, um, that numbers would go up, case numbers would go up, uh, rapidly after the reopening in July, and, and some people were very alarmist about that, uh, and that doesn't seem to have happened. Um, but there have been many other instances, I think, where the models were, were actually uh, off. Um, that, that clearly influences people's trust in the models, right? How do you deal with that huge uncertainty and the fact that you're sometimes going to be wrong? Yeah, I think it, it ultimately comes down to communication. And I think the way in the UK um, these kind of model scenarios have been used, used were really as a policy tool, not, not as a prediction. I think it's, it's the, the, there's a very clear communication channel between the modelers and politicians in the UK. And there's a lot of translation work and interpretation work that goes on there in order to make sure that really the, both relevant questions are being answered by the modelers, but then also the answers are kind of interpreted correctly. And the to me, I don't think anybody of the modelers or any model would have been able in, in July to predict what's going on. And often, in fact, the scenarios are set by politicians. It's, so it might be a scenario where, for example, um, an expectation there's a further opening as was going on in July. If we assume that people have twice as many contacts as they had before, what would happen? And then you, you get the output from the models. But, no model in the world is able to make a reliable prediction for something like a COVID-19 epidemic for more than a few weeks ahead. So if you want really firm, reliable predictions, then, um, well, there's nothing you can do. A model can't answer you that. You know, and, and in fact, it's often, um, there's a kind of plausibility check you often need to do with models. models and, and, and I like the um, kind of how Amrish said, you, you kind of you, you provide the information, and then some magic happens, and then you get the output. And I think often it 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 really the insights from models are often they're not often particularly controversial or kind of um, once you look at the assumptions that go into the models, they often seem obvious. It's just that they, they provide a certain clarity in putting these assumptions together, and then getting an outcome. But um, in terms of what's going to happen in the next X months or so with COVID, then there's just such huge uncertainty in the assumptions and whether the assumptions are going to be correct, that no model in the world, whatever it does, will be able to to answer that correctly. So I think it, it but to answer your question, I think it ultimately comes down to communication and to, to ensuring that there's no expectation that these models that are scenarios with a very clear set of assumptions where every modeler knows that none of the assumptions will exactly come to pass and there are planning tools. Um, if, if that is clearly communicated uh, that, and, and that expectation is avoided, that it's a genuine prediction, um, that, I think that is how we avoid this kind of critique that might then be levied at the modelers as, as, as uh, that, that th predictions were wrong if they weren't genuine predictions. Right. Sheetal, do you, do you want to weigh in on that? I 
completely agree with what um, Sebastian has said. Um, it's, it, so I think what we've learned in this pandemic is that as much as you may have had a group of modelers doing modeling, you almost, the modelers themselves almost needed a communications team behind them to be able to, to do this kind of explanation to the public. Um, and I think that really would have helped our cause if we were able to have more resources to dedicate towards um, almost teaching the public the basics behind disease modeling. And as Sebastian so eloquently put, what the difference is are between predictions and projections and scenarios mm -hmm. but we were operating in an emergency setting and perhaps you know other than um, writing a couple of articles in the media and maybe having a Twitter account it was very hard to establish a, a public uh, or a, a communication platform for your clients or your stakeholders as well as the public right yeah. uh, but do you understand that the, that this undermines the public's confidence in the models that at some point they're like I don't know all these models mm -hmm. I don't know what to believe anymore Certainly, I think it has, uh, that, has been a, that has been an issue and one that we hope to, I, I would believe, rectify okay. as we model into the future. Okay, and, and do modelers get uh, training for that, for communication? I mean, uh, or is that not something you learn on the job? Um, I think for most uh, people, you learn it on the job, and particularly as we're saying emergency settings now. But I th I, we have, at least in some of the networks in which I uh, work, we do try offer media training for, for up and coming modelers. To, so, how do, how do you conduct yourself in the media? What are ways in which to communicate? But that costs money, and money isn't always available for communications when you're trying to make salaries as a, as a modeler. Right. Okay. Uh Sebastian, how have you learned to communicate the outcomes of your models and the, and the uncertainty that comes with them? The hard way, by being often, or being, being misunderstood often enough that um, eventually, you know, you kind of learn to, to attach enough notes of caution to, to results that you present and enough uncertainty. And it, and it, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, it, it's not purely, and I don't want it to come across as purely being misunderstanding from the from the recipients of the model. It's also, um, obviously, it's on us to, to learn to become better in, in communicating and to uh, not communicating modeling results without also communicating the limitations and the assumptions that go into them. The other issue is that in the UK, for example, and, and this is quite often the case when we work with policymakers. The, the models really are a tool, and and there's a you know they, they they arise from a specific conversation with policymakers, with decision makers, or with um, politicians, often via intermediaries or via um, kind of health departments or ministries of health or or um, charitable organisations like MSF. And there's right. specific questions, and then you know we as modelers try to find specific answers. And then this, this, it's good that this is done in public, and I think it's important that the public is aware of what informs policy, but then that communication that led to generating these results, it often, get, often gets lost in when, when results just get presented. So all you see, all the general public then ends up seeing is a plot of future cases that maybe looks like a prediction, but never was designed to be one. And right. so I think it's, it's clear communication that's required at all levels of, of interaction there. Right. Julia, do you want to weigh in on that question about communication of the uncertainty in models? Well, no, I, I mean, I, I said it um, in, in my presentation as well. I think this, the, and, and as the other speakers have said, the, the uncertainty is, is an important thing. And, and I mean, risk communication is, a, is an, an area in the, of it, on its own, which uh, we, we've started engaging more with and I think it's it's another thing that we need to even uh, take forward more and translating technical results in more usable language that everybody can understand I think is is has shown now in the um, pandemic that it is very very important and people have there's lots of good good examples on how that can be done and I think we need to do that more, even more and the uncertainty is it's not only starting from the model that's the, that's what i try to bring across as well and i think that others have been saying as well it starts with the data we, we um we and and we probably need to get better to not just always just put the data as a as a linear but, but use more more semantics with the data 
Right. Okay. We're getting some questions from the audience, and uh, I would encourage you to send in more if you have them um, for our speakers. Uh, I'll, I'll take the first one. It's, it's pretty specific, but it's interesting. The question is, how do mobile phones change some negative aspects of data collection from your point of view? Mobile, mobile phones are omnipresent, have many sensors, data transmission, etc. And I think that's interesting because, you know, theoretically, with the data from, from mobile phones, you can collect vast amount of information on people's movements, how many other people they see, whether they go to bars, restaurants, etc. Uh, so for, I, I can imagine that that's a, you know, a, a dream almost for modelers, but uh, clearly there are also huge privacy aspects related to that. Um, she talking to you? Sure. Um, so during the COVID uh, pandemic and modeling the epidemic in South Africa, we did make use of mobile phone records, in particular the data event type of uh, data. So recording how many pings were um, uh, in the area in which you woke up and then the pings in other districts or wards around uh, uh, throughout the day. Um, that was useful for us, um, in particularly with respect to understanding the spatial connectivity between minor uh, districts, because you could, um, perhaps at your easiest assumption, use uh, an inverse distance weighting method where you consider that areas, people will most likely travel to areas around them with a greater probability than areas further away, but especially when we bring economic travel into account and you take um, restrictions um, on certain kinds of travel, these inverse distance weighting models don't really work. So the mobility data from mobile phone records helped us get a much better idea between the different restriction levels how movement was actually occurring um, during, the, um, during the pandemic. The difficulty, of course, was the number one, securing the contract to actually get the mobile data. So we only got the data maybe three, four months into the pandemic because these things take time. We also couldn't, um, um, are not necessarily able to publish the data because it's not our data to publish. There are severe restrictions um, on that. So I think all we have to, as much as mobile data is extremely useful in looking at spatial connectivity and spatial movement for individuals, it, we do have to take into account the privacy concerns as well. Yeah. Uh, because Sebastian mentioned uh, that uh, human behavior is, is one of the most mm -hmm. difficult things in the end to model, but uh, this gets you pretty far along with uh, collecting data on human behavior, right, Sebastian? In, in principle, yes. Um, in practice, it's, I found, in my experience, it's often more difficult. And I think um, I, I, I really like the, the, the examples that Shithal gave and, and how they've used the data in South Africa. And I think it's, it's, there's definitely huge potential in there to unlock. But at the same time, it's, it's fairly complicated data. And I think it's, from my perspective, the real data gaps that we ha have had in this pandemic weren't kind of more complex data on people's behavior. It was really the simple stuff. It was like how many, you know, early on in the in the in the pandemic in the UK, and I think the same as where we were really flying blind because we didn't know how many cases there were um, across the country, and because there wasn't much testing going on, and um, you know, was, we had to kind of try to paint a picture from disparate sources of data on hospitalizations, and you know, there wasn't any testing in the community, and we tried to set things up and get things off the ground. And now in the UK, I think it's an exemplary you know, data collection and data provision system with a lot of data being publicly available and a lot of useful analysis being done on that purely on the clinical data. Then there's all the kind of contextual stuff like, okay, how people move about and mobile phones. And, um, you know, it's, it's much more difficult to do something with that on the rapid timescales that you often have to respond in a pandemic. Right. That said, I mean, as Sheetal very nicely laid out, there's huge potential in, in, in using that kind of data and certainly something that will be play a role in years to come. Right. Okay. I have another question from the public. Uh, several of you stress that models are policy tools. Could you elaborate? How are they used in practice? So let's, let's give another set of concrete examples briefly, please. Maybe I can start with you, Amrish. How can models, how are they policy tools? Let's make this a bit more concrete. Yes, I, I think in, in many ways, um, you know, they, they can inform us better in terms of, you know, what, what 
different scenarios and how they could play out. And I think that's the most interesting element of, you know, of policy makers as well. And I'm not speaking again about, about the context that we as Doctors uh, Without Borders work in because, yeah, you know, gathering that quality data, you know, we're, we're not there yet. But can you give an example of a disease that you have worked on where the, the, the model was an important policy tool where it led to a concrete change? Uh, um, not by itself, at least I, I can come up with examples where we've used that data in that way that it led to concrete changes. Good epidemiological studies, yes. Right, right. Good descriptive studies, yes. Okay. But modeling, uh, not directly, and that's okay. just maybe because of the limit in, in of the context that we work in. Right. Sheetal, can you give examples? Um, so I'll give a non-COVID example. Mm -hmm. um, back in 20, say 2017, 2018, we were conducting at the time a malaria elimination investment case in South Africa. So the purpose of this uh, this um, modeling exercise, which was initiated by government for the purpose of policy change, was to develop a model for South Africa, make projections and develop a set of scenarios as to, uh, with the current policies, what, uh, where the country might be in achieving malaria elimination in the next 10 years, and if we made certain changes to our policy, so did a few more interventions of different kinds, where might that, uh, how could we in fact get to elimination? We had to cost it, and then we had to work out the funding gap. So if we were to implement this policy, what would the outstanding funding be? So we did that. Um, we developed a, a mathematical model of malaria transmission in South Africa, ran a variety of scenarios, some that were in line with current government policy, some completely out of the box. Um, and it turned out that the one scenario, or, or, the, or the, the general scenario that led to elimination within the time frame that we were happy with, was one that required investing domestic South African resources, so money from South Africa's taxpayers, investing this money into uh, reducing malaria in Mozambique, our neighboring country. And that's quite an out-of-the-box policy in the sense that you're using domestic funding to help a neighboring country reduce their malaria. That came out purely from the model. The model was then used as evidence to seek funding from the national treasury in the country to, to implement um, the costed amount costed by the model. And then it was subsequently granted right. and is now underway. Okay. So yeah. it's an example where Direct you really link, yeah. <laughs> tell the government where to put its money in a way or what, what it can expect for a yeah. certain investment. Yeah. Right. And may I just add to that to, to complete the example that it was only possible because there was, it wasn't just, oh, the modelers are telling the government. The government and modelers together came up with, 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 the, with the project and were partners throughout the project and in the communication right from beginning to end. So it was a true partnership. Right. And I think that is why it's successful. Right. Um, Julia, do you have an example of uh, the models as, a, as an important policy tool for the World Health Organization? Well, there are lots of them, and honestly, and I mean, st sticking with um, COVID, even in the very early beginning, there was this question, is it, does it make sense um, to close borders? Does it make sense to, to, to do uh, these rigid um, closing closing of economies and and a lot was done through these different scenarios and they were done in the different ways they were done at global level and we and in discussions with the different experts and they were done in each and most uh, in each of the different countries as well and um and and it was a very very hot discussed thing the problem at the, at the very beginning, obviously, was that there wasn't a lot of data, and there, so there was a lot of uncertainty about a lot of the things. But, but the models absolutely helped and, and were were used and and are used all along. So I mean, now also, I mean, how can we? How is vaccination taking out? How is Delta, the Delta variant, or a new other variant influencing potentially the the effects? All this is done with models, and there are different models. There's also the model just on how um to, to, not necessarily it is now cast and forecast the model is also used to actually see effects and um and going out of of of, of um of covid it's like even the, the like the global burden studies all that are models and and they are helping to compare burden to each other and and to put them um to see what is the most Im important part to to take actions now so, yes, there are lots of them to use oh, okay. modeling for decision making. Thank you for that. I want to go back uh, to, to Amrish's talk because um, he basically 
said, but his ba basic point is yes, sometimes the models are a distraction. And apparently in, in, in these really dire situations in refugee camps, they're not all that useful. And you showed us a paper about COVID in, in a camp in Bangladesh. And you said it's not, you know, these, these people have never been on the ground. They don't really know the situation. So it's kind of sad if, if the models don't work for you, uh, how, how can that change? And has the pandemic changed that? I mean, are people working together a little bit better than they used to? Well, I think what all of us agree is that it's all about the interdisciplinary concept, right? So um, we need strong academics to help us because we're busy with our day-to-day -day work um, and we can't do it by ourselves because we lack that type of specific knowledge. At the same time, to feed models, you need high quality data. Um, and, I, and I think that's kind of like the, the whole prospect on, on models itself during a pandemic like this. It's one of the tools, right? Mm -hmm. uh, a large part of the tools, and I think Mike Ryan at WHO said it best, right? If you, if you wait too long before you act, you will always be too late. Um, if you need to wait for models to get data fed, as a policymaker, you still need to take some forms of decisions and those decisions at that point in time maybe need to rely more on the operational experience that you have on simple descriptive, you know, epidemiology. But then if, you know, your health professionals don't understand what exponential growth is, your policymakers don't understand what exponential growth is, and your national public health agencies have very limited capacity to actually do descriptive analytics because on the top layer they have to deal with all the questions that policymakers keep on asking them, and they know what questions to ask, but they don't have the capacity to actually answer those simple questions. That's when you get stuck. Right. And I think this pandemic has been visualizing that in, in a very good way. So I think, you know, it's time for acknowledging that there is a healthy codependency between all of us, that we are going to an era where we will see more difficult crises and that we also need to be very honest in the attributions and the bits of the puzzle pieces we bring together to, to work towards solutions. But as I said, it does require some honest solutions. I think sometimes we are very distant from each other's worlds. Um, and you know that's sometimes that's something that's neglected because right. we immediately jump to the technical aspects of the right. discussion. We don't talk about the context and the body around it. Right. Okay. Next question from the public. Um, uh, a technical question maybe for our modelers. How, which areas of computer science do you think are the most helpful for epidemiologists? Hmm. Sebastian or Shetan, can you talk about that? Um, for com well, if you're speaking about computer science uh, specifically, they are, I, for me, I would imagine two two aspects. One is on um, if we have complex sets of data that require a quick uh, quick analysis of perhaps large data sets like contact data or um, mobile data. Uh, having skills in computer science, I think, are very vital to be able to process that data really quickly. Um, two would be on optimizing our modeling code, so in order to make the models run more efficiently, but in a sensible way that they can be altered with uh, relative ease. Mm -hmm. Often the modelers themselves have learned and become computer scientists in themselves, but to have, um, set, uh, to have those who will come from a computer science background working with the modelers, mm -hmm. I think that just serves to, to make the process easier. Um, and actually, third one, I think where um, the computer sciences can also be really um, useful uh, as a skill is in developing dashboards and tools and uh, writing up our packages and, uh, and, and all of that in order to make these tools uh, available quickly for those who need them. Okay. Sebastian, do you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I, I very much agree. I was going to say um, tools, and I really like that. Amrish mentioned that and R4 IPs. I think it's a real, um, it's also, it's a kind of, um, it's an equity issue. I think that modeling capacity and analytical capacity is hugely concentrated in rich countries. And I think um, there's a kind of monopolization of the the, the kind of having the, the, the ability to do things, um, you know, analytics. And, and, and I think there's huge amount of, well, there's huge scope for developing more general tools as well as documentations and uh, documentation of those tools and instructional material that could really be a huge boost to capacity around the world in doing outbreak analytics and, and uh, you know, do useful things in emergencies. And I think that's the, I don't know if that's exactly computer science, but it's certainly a contribution that computation could, could make. All right, thank you. And, and um, you, you are modelers, but you're, you're scientists. And we all know that uh, in science, it's publish or perish. You need to publish papers to advance your career. Um, 
but at the same time, you, you also spend a lot of time on, on, on making these models, making forecasts for decision makers, you know, public, publishing these, posting these fancy, fancy dashboards where people can, you know, do their own interactive modeling. Um, but, but so, so what, what to you is more important, you know, publishing those papers or doing all of these other things? And do you, can you get credit for all of these other things as an as a, as a outbreak modeler? Sebastian, maybe you first. Yeah, you're really uh, running into the open doors there with, with, with how I think about these things. I think there's a, the, the, the academic model is, is an obstacle to useful, useful outbreak response, and it really needs to change. And I think that there is some change, and there needs to be a lot more of it. I think contributions that um, people in, in science and academia make to responding to outbreaks, humanitarian crisis, crisis in general, doesn't have to be crises, I think need to be acknowledged beyond academic papers and uh, you know things like dashboards that are created or we talked about tools you know it's very difficult to get credit for it. and there's no real incentive to make a generalizable tool you know you the, the incentive is much more to publish your one high impact paper and then move on to the next thing and uh, it's 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 really not sustainable and i think with the what the covid crisis or covid pandemic has brought out is that there are crises that happen at a scale that is beyond any government's capacity, and there's real there, there, there's real benefit in drawing in um, expertise and capacity from academia. But th there then needs to be some kind of system that rewards it, and I don't think that's in place. And uh, you know, I think in in my case, um, you know, I've I've had the luxury of a, a fairly long term contract and job, so I could de-incentivize writing papers and focus more on pro trying to provide useful info to policy, but many don't have that luxury. And yeah. it's particularly on the back of early career researchers that are doing a lot of the work that is relevant in in, in, in a moment like this. And um, yeah, I think there's some change happen, but, uh, happening, but a lot more needs to come. And really we've done this with the goodwill of, of a lot of young researchers, I think, who have put their careers back a little bit in order to provide a, a useful contribution. I'm hoping that that will be recognized going forward in job applications and promotion procedures. Right. Um, but I'd like to see more of it. Okay, so there needs to be a change in the in the reward system. I assume you agree, Shital. Have you published much in the last couple of years? Uh, no, no, no. I've got many, many papers on the back burner. Right. B because we have an incentive to work and you, by establishing these relationships with government, in order to keep them, you have to produce, you have to make projections and help to answer policy questions as they, as they arise. I'm lucky at my university that these kind of social engagements are, um, uh, or social entrepreneurship or these kinds of ideas are credited, but that's not the same everywhere. So right. I think there's a real need for the change in the academic structure of, of credits. Okay. Um, I have another interesting question from the audience. Uh, what lessons, if any, do you think that uh, the climate change modelers can learn from epidemiological modeling, for instance, about dealing with different stakeholders? Um, Julia, would you, can you say something about that? Well, I actually think, it, again, the multidisciplinary is, is, an, is key, and I think we need to work together in both ways, because climate change is, and, and disease are actually closely linked. And so I, I think we, we, we should not even think in these kind of barriers of, of, of one or the other, and, and making it more, um, making results more available and, and being able to communicate the, the, the outcomes is, is an important part for both of them. And, and actually, let me one, uh, go back also to the question before. I'm sorry, Martin, but, but I have a strong feeling that, uh, with this publications as well. I actually even think that, that the publications also harm because we hold back information because it needs to be published. And, um, and it is difficult to actually read through all the publications because th there's a long text and we don't actually get to the things. So I really think that there is time for thinking of, of this rewarding through publications. Okay. Over. Okay. Um, we're, we're nearing the end. So um, um, I, have, I have one more question, maybe for each of you, quickly, uh, if you can, uh, because some people in the audience might be interested themselves in, in, in modeling and might consider a career. What uh, do you think you need as a, uh, as a 
mathematician or computer scientist uh, to become a modeler? What does it take beyond empathy, which <laughs> Sheetal already mentioned? Um, Sebastian, I'm going to start with you. I think really not much more than an open mind, a willingness to listen and to learn and to understand what kind of key um, concepts and issues are in other disciplines. I think, um, you know, in, in, in principle, in terms of technical capability, we have a lot of mathematicians, computer scientists in, in modeling. And so I think there's really, people are well set up from those disciplines to make a contribution, but it, it, it does require kind of a, a really a, a, a humble and open mind and, and to be able to learn kind of what, yeah, what, what the key concepts are in another field of science, which is also, it's, it's fascinating and interesting to learn. Yeah, um, uh, that's, but, but I, I, guess that's, the key. I guess that's true for yeah. almost any real scientist, right? Anything. Julia, you know, you know lots of modelers. What, what do you think they really need? Just a few words. Well, I think the... Um, Oh, one is obviously the, math, the, the the idea for data and the idea for math, for computer science, computing as well. And and they need to be, I mean, for a good one, it really is to, to sort of think about the context and take critic and, and be open and transparent. I think that's really helpful. It's this trust that we need for them, that they need to build for, okay. for their model to be accepted. Okay. Amrish? Well, I think the, the proper understanding that whatever data set you are working on only represents a, a small subset of reality, um, right? And, and that you need to think in limitations, uh, whatever output you generate. And yeah, I mean, humility is definitely a big aspect to that as well. Yeah. I think humility is always good. Shita. <laughs> um, so I certainly agree with all my colleagues have put forward. I think to add to um, the key uh, ideas of, of humility and technical skill, I'd like to add integrity. And this, is, this speaks for all disciplines, sure, but I think with respect to modeling and as scientists, when you're operating in the face of the media, in the face of uh, powerful members of government, all you have is your integrity. Mm -hmm. And I think that that um, should really be at the forefront of any kind of communication and modeling endeavor. Okay, I think that's a, that's a terrific point to end this uh, mm -hmm. discussion on. Um, uh, in a few minutes, you will be able to join the fishbowl sessions where you can ask our panelists uh, even more questions uh, about what you've heard, maybe also other things. Maybe you want to know more about their careers or their organization, or uh, maybe you want career advice. Uh, so please join them and you can wander from room to room. Um, we will not go back to this plenary session afterwards, so uh, I would uh, at this point like to thank our speakers, Sebastian, Julia, Sheetal and Amrish very much for their, uh, for their interesting presentations and, uh, and thoughtful comments. And I'd also like to thank you, the audience, for your uh, interest and, uh, and the excellent questions. I hope the rest of the forum is as interesting as this session. And um, that's it for us. Thank you and goodbye from Heidelberg.